So this is the third Lancaster International Fiction Lecture. The first one was given by the Colombian author Juan Gabriel Vasquez in 2021. And then last year, Gitanjali Shri, the Booker International winner from India, um, what, uh, who won with uh, Tomb of Sand, gave the lecture. And this year, we count ourselves very lucky to welcome Georgi Gospodinov, um, as, as I've said, winner of this year's Booker International Prize, to give the Lancaster International Fiction Lecture on the theme of, of um, literature and particularly fiction as an international art form. And his chosen title tonight will be the first thing he reads out. So um, a word about Georgi. Um, we first came across him at the Litfest International Fiction Book Club reading his novel Physics of Sorrow, um, then published in America by Open Letter Books, which will now be published um, by WNN, Feldenfeld and Nicholson, sometime I think next year. <clears throat> um, his books are run by philosophical um, digressions. Often they progress by digression. But actually, if you read, if you've read Time Shelter, you know you'll know that it's a beautifully structured book. But he, he, his style allows him to, to think aloud, as it were. And that's one of the pleasures of the, of the novels. You know you're in the company of a really good writer if you can hold your attention while, while thinking aloud. Um, so Georgi will give his lecture. It'll be about 20, 25 minutes. And then when, he's, when, when it's over, Sam O'Donoghue, who, who um, you have met just a minute ago, will come back on and he'll have a conversation with Georgi for about a um, quarter of an hour, leaving quarter of an hour at about 8.15 for Q&A. So please um, find the question box in, on the right-hand side of your screen. You'll see a question mark. And if you put your cursor over it, it'll say Q&A. So you can drop your questions into that. Um, if you put them in the chat, um, we'll try and pick them up from there, but it would help us if you would use the Q&A box. So that's the shape of the evening. Um, it's now all that has to be said is, Georgi, the floor is yours. Over to you. So can you hear me now? Yeah, I hope so. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for the invitation. The title of my lecture is what fiction, including in translation, can do in times like ours? Nothing. That would be the shortest, punchiest, and most pessimistic answer to this question. But if we actually, and not for the sake of rhetorical flashiness, answer it like this, we should immediately nix this text, close down the festivals, toss out the libraries, give up, on creating literature and sit meekly waiting for the end of the world. Because if we stop telling stories about the world, the end is indeed near. Literature, storytelling and fiction in particular can actually perform simple miracles. My first experience of this came when I was six or seven years old. So I will start with a personal story. I had a nightmare which not only was terrible, but it also recurred every night. One morning, I got up the courage to tell it to my grandmother. At the time, I was living with her in the village. But as soon as I started, she stopped me, pressing a finger to her lips. Scary dreams should not be retold, because it makes them come true. Actually, she put it much more beautifully. They fill with blood and come to life. So I was left alone with my nightmare, unable to tell it to anyone, yet also lacking the strength to hold it in. Then I came up with the brilliant, to my mind, idea, we can only be brilliant at six or seven, of writing down my dream. I secretly tore a page out of my grandpa's notebook and using the freshly learned letters of the alphabet, 
in a rather ugly scroll, I wrote out my dream and I got my miracle. I never had that nightmare again, but I also never forgot it. That was the price. I still remember it today, 49 years later, I may decide to tell it at the end. There are two things I want to pull from the thread of this memory today. Writing saves us from our fears. The second thing was that writing produces memory. We tell stories so as to remember. Sometimes the inverse is true. We remember so as to have a story to tell. Yes, writing produces memory, even if that memory is a frightening thing. But the memory of frightening things is not always a frightening memory. On the contrary, once told, once cause it is set in the rooms of memory, frightening things begin to lose their frightfulness. Through storytelling, we tame little by little the beasts of fear. Why do we tell children stories at night before they fall asleep? For the same reason that myths exist. We tell stories to tame the world which was primordially wild in its inception and which is now growing feral or savage at its end. We tell stories to explain a chaotic and inexplicable world of thunderstorms, fire and floods outside of us, as well as a world of the same elements within us. As we tell stories, we create the illusion that this world is even narratable, that it can be short, shorthorned into words and shared, and orderably that it can be organized at all. Secretly, I suspect there is no order and only our stories created, but that makes our narratives all the more important. We narrate so as to preserve the wholeness of the world and to bring meaning to what happens to it and to us in the face of the secret suspicions that there is no meaning. For the same reason, we read books and especially fiction. Many people mistakenly believe that fiction is imaginary, untrue, non facial literature, and thus they divide literature into fictional and documentary. I find this a profound misunderstanding. Fiction, fiction creates a myth and gives meaning to reality. It invents a legend of the visible, shapes it into narrative and explains it to us. Myth is nothing, that is everything, says Pessoa. Fiction can generate real memories. I will never forget how, after reading War and Peace, I lay on the Austerlitz battlefield and watched the clouds above me as if for the first time. How could I have never noticed them before? I tell myself in my own voice, not that of the wounded Prince Bolkonsky. After 100 years of solitude by Marcus, I have a clear memory of an afternoon when my father took me to the gypsies to see real eyes for the first time. I also remember a blizzard and the candle flickering in the room a la Pasternak. And so, what other specific things can literature and fiction do besides create memory and tame fears? They can do other simple things, like saving a life, for example. Literature tells stories and thus postpones the end. We know this best from Sheikh Rizad. With every story she tells, she wins another day of life. Inside her stories, the most frequent bargaining chip for a life is against stories. Do the stories change Shahriya, that serial killer of women? Do they awaken his sympathy for this world? Who knows? But they infuse him with the drug of a new curiosity about the world with all its wonders, twists and turns, laughs and deceptions. When the victim tells a story, she temporarily dwells in another protected zone. The woman or men telling the story and their listeners or readers are now inside the labyrinth of the story itself, in another space. In other words, they reside in two places at once, the real and the fictional. 
and in two times simultaneously. This brings us back to elementary particles in quantum physics, which can also exist in two places at once. Literature and quantum physics are much more similar than we might suspect. What's more, to our benefit, the benefit of writers and readers, that is, literature knew these things centuries before science discovered them. And so, as long as the story lasts, Chakrizad's life is assured, guaranteed by the telling itself. And the story, like the labyrinth, is endless. This is what I would like us to remember from the great story of Chakrizad, the power of the weak to tell stories, the special guarantee that literature provides. As a child, I subconsciously sense this because I always choose to read books narrated in the first person singular. I knew their main characters would never die at the end of the book. As long as I'm telling stories, I exist. As long as I'm telling stories, I keep myself and the world around me whole. I narrate, therefore, I am. What else can storytelling and literature do, especially in turbulent times like today? No matter what we do, today we find ourselves in the context of war on the edge of Europe. The recent one looming in the Middle East and the war against Ukraine being fought already for 20 months. These are real wars with tanks, drones, dead soldiers and civilians, fleeing families, destroyed cities and landscapes. All of this happened today in a Europe that thought it had been, it had freed itself from the horrors of war for good. But Putin's invasion of Ukraine did not begin with the first shots fired and the advance of Russian tanks. It began long before that with propaganda and fake news. The battle of words and stories, the artillery of propaganda, continues in parallel with the battles on the front. The aim is to weaken the position of the human, to break resistance in advance. Precisely here is this point where fiction and literature should step in. What, broadly speaking, can fiction do? Literature acts as a natural antidote to the poison of propaganda. Propaganda tries to explain the world to us two-dimensionally in three minutes. This is good, this is evil. Literature not only gives us a deeper, more complex and fuller picture, but it also teaches us something very important. For fiction, the individuals are central, with their fears, hopes, fragility, dreams and sorrows. Propaganda is also interested in fears and desires but only as tools for collective manipulation. Whether we realize it or not, today we are present at, no, we are actually participating in a grand and at times invisible battle, not just to save human life, but to save the very essence of the human and of life itself. What's more things, what's more, things have come to the point where we can no longer save people unless we save all living beings and nature itself. And an egocentric or anthropocentric escape from this situation is impossible. Hearing the voices and stories of others, not just people, but all living creatures, though fiction saves life itself. True fiction saves life, lives itself. This is the great battle in the stories of the world and humanity. And literature, too, plays a role in it, especially in times of war that draws the threat of climate apocalypse even closer. As for literature and translation, it gives us the full picture, the whole range of voices and stories. We live in a world where there is no longer a center and a periphery. When we have a pandemic, war, a catastrophe, the center of the world is movable. It follows the pain. Today, Europe is bleeding in the East, and so the stories of people from that part of the world can tell us more about that. The world today 
has multiple points of pain and upheaval. Thus, the translation of voices and stories from those places is vital for us. I would even say it is life-saving. Because what hurts there already hurts everywhere. And you, can, you can't be happy or at peace at one end while someone is crying for help at the other. I wrote part of my novel Time Shelter in a library that I will call the Library of the World. Every library is a time shelter. I remember going upstairs to the Rose main reading room. Yes, it's the New York Public Library. When I was feeling particularly anxious and running my eyes over the uniform, cherry, red, or black spines of the books, sometimes touching them with my hand. Nothing is as comforting as those identical rows of volumes. Their titles really can be used as a mantra against evil, spirits, and times, as the narrator says in the novel. Everything sooner or later ends up in a book, as Mallarmé put it in the dead quote so beloved by Borges, which, then you think about it, is not such a bad result. The people I rely on in times of crisis are on the side of literature and uncertainty, of hesitation and torment, and they are the real experts on crisis. Their names are Pessoa. Kafka, Eliot, Virginia Woolf, Borges, to mention just a few. We are slowly coming to realize that the world cannot be explained through political and economic relations alone, because we are not made of economics and politics. We are also made of sadness and hesitation, of such fragile and inex inexplicable things. And therein is the place of literature, of its expertise, to use that language. What else can literature do? Create taste. This should not be underestimated in the least. It's not just a question of aesthetics. A person with taste is less susceptible to flimsy propaganda. They can see all the political kitsch that underlies nationalism, for example. And that is already a political act. A person tells a story when there is an ear ready to hear. Here, I think it's important to point this out because we are praising storytelling. Storytelling is important, but it's nothing without the feeling that somewhere there is an ear ready to hear. There is no storytelling without story hearing. If we were to depict the writer with only one body part, it would not be a writing hand or a moat uttering precious words. Most often I see the writer as an ear, one big ear listening to the stories of the world. An ear and a heart, an ear attuned to everything that hurts. Today we have a strong need for empathy, which is crucial both personally and politically. Totalitarian or total ideology and fundamentalism are incapable of empathy. For them, the other, the enemy, is removed from human nature because the human distracts, it diverts, it is a source of weakness and hesitation. I don't want to get into some strict scientific definition of empathy because I think everyone knows about this stepping into the shoes of the other and also because we have started to overuse this concept. Yet, I argue that we must use it more broadly. Empathy is not just innate. It is acquired, learned, and developed through daily exercise, including through reading fiction. Empathy is the bare minimum without which neither storytelling, nor reading and listening, nor living are possible. How can you read a novel without empathy? How can you live among others without empathy? But who is the other today? Normally, when we talk about empathy, we stay consciously or not within the bounds of the human species. Isn't it time to move towards a broader environmental empathy? Actually, if we remember fairy tales and our own childhood, we will see that literature and children have known about 
and been practicing this for a long time. They are talking to a snail, a dog, or a rose, and empathizing with their stories is a perfectly natural thing to do. Man needs to shut up for a while and in the ensuring pause to hear the voice of some other storyteller. A fish, dragonfly, weasel, or bamboo, cat, orchid, or pebble. The narrator in my previous novel, The Physics of Sorrow, insisted upon this. Incidentally, the most recent studies by environmental scientists wondering how to motivate people to protect the natural world once again lead us to empathy. Let's go on a brief evolutionary tangent here. The widespread belief is that sympathy and helping those who are weaker is not a priority of natural selection. Nature and evolution would not tolerate anything like empathy for the other. Ergo selfishness will always turn altruism. Yet there is an interesting opinion from the evolutionary biologist David Wilson, a follower of Darwin, who notes that in evolutionary terms, selfishness beats altruism within groups, but altruistic groups beat selfish ones. Now, if we shift to a historical perspective, we would see that altruistic societies have been more developed and sensitive and have performed better in politics, economy, culture, and human happiness than dictatorships. This can be verified. Perhaps the time is coming to tell new stories about the future, to populate its empty rooms with the stories we want to inhabit. But before that, let's hear the stories and voices of the present, the stories of fathers, of migrants, of refugees, of those fleeing war, of those who have survived in the bomb shelters of Ukraine today. Let's tell and hear these stories again and again until we create a memory strong enough to prevent this nightmare from recurring, at least not so soon. Finally, let me tell you that nightmare from 49 years ago, which I never had again after I wrote it down, but which I never forgot either. The dream was simple and scary. At the bottom of our village well is my entire family, my mother, father, and brother. The well is deep and dark. I can just see their silhouettes looking up, unable to get out. I'm the only one outside, saved but alone. The fear is twofold. First for them and second for me. I'm separated from them. I'm not with them, even if at the bottom of the well. I'm abandoned. This double fear for others and for myself, this feeling of abandonment probably made me a writer or at least gave rise to that first story of mine. And writing it down helped. My reasons for continuing to write today probably haven't changed much from that boy's reason for writing down his nightmare. I write because I don't want the nightmares to repeat night by night and to come through. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Georgi, for that um, powerful defense of literature um, that you just offered. Um, one of the first, one of the thoughts I had um, when you were giving this defense um, of literature's power in society, especially now, um, seeing the, the various crises that humanity is facing. Um, I thought that much of what you said about writing relies on people having time and spending that time reading books. And yet we seem to live in a society where there are all these different things competing for our time. Um, that seem to rob us of that valuable time we need to invest in a work of fiction. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what, what you think we can do to, to really tell people about why it's so important to read. And you've given all sorts of reasons for why reading fiction is important. I mean, are there any practical things, do you think, at a, a social level almost that, um, that we could do? 
Um, I think that reading fiction really have and will have future in our days and in, in the close time and the close future uh, because of many reasons. Because I, we slowly realize that the social media uh, give us another this is something different. Reading social media is really, really quite different from reading a book. And it's really, I could say, when you read social media, you're scrolling. This is the right term. You make your finger vertically. When you read book, you read in horizontal well, well, way, and you, you could stay how long you want in one page. And this is, of course, this is improve your deep reading, your deep thinking. This is another structure of thinking, different than the uh, reading social media. I think that literature is a slow media, and paradoxically, this is it. This is its quality because it's a slow media. In the last years, we we told that media must be fast and everything that is fast is better that is faster is better now uh, we will realize that the slow reading the slow thinking staying concentrated for a long time is a really it will be real value do you know this uh, one of my favorite uh, legends about bedouins you know that bedouins when they walked through the desert, they stopped frequently, not because of the camel, camels, 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 not because of camels or to take rest, but because to give time to their souls to catch up with them. Because they know that soul, our souls have a different speed. And when you read book, you give this rest to wait for your souls to, to catch up with you. Uh, and many, many other reasons I can, I can show why. Why the reading has future. I mean, the reading of fiction, the reading of serious literature, slow reading, reading from the books, have and will have more and more future. Oh, thank you. Um, so... I mean, just to just to to continue on that theme, um, you you talked about the interaction between literature and science. Um, so you, you talked about your um, your previous novel, The Physics of Sorrow. Um, there's so you know you're you're evidently interested in um, scientific themes, and they find their way into your work. Um, and again, science seems to be, um, you know, it's, it's on the agenda. There's an emphasis in society today on the kind of knowledge that science gives us, um, perhaps at the expense of um, literature and the humanities in general. Um, you've given us some arguments for fighting back against that trend, I think, um, in your defense of literature's role in producing empathy. Um, how else do you think literature can literature the humanities can reclaim space um, from the you know the scientific agenda if you like? You know what happened when my book Time Shelter was published even before the Booker nominations, I, I was invited uh, from a Department of Neuroscientists in Bologna University. To have talk with them about memory, Alzheimer, because this book is dedicated to, to these topics. And it was a serious discussion with a serious professor, professors on the topics that were close to them, not, not to me, uh, about memory, Alzheimer, and what we can do uh, to unlock our memories. And they really interested in the role of storytelling, the role of literature of this process, because we know that uh, smells are very important for the memory. They, they are one of the unlockers of the memory. Also music, musical structures are the last that stay in our brains when, you, when we are losing our memory. But also storytelling 
is another key for the memory. When I tell you my story, I produce memory in your, in your head. In a way, I unlock memories in your head. And I was very glad that people from the scientists, from science, really uh, want to talk with us from the field of literature about the, about the brain, about the memory. more and more that literature knows some things and could help to science and science could help to literature uh, by the way uh, you know this beautiful short story by Borges Funes de Memorias uh, you know that they are a serious scientific book um, dedicated to this to this short story from a famous professor, professor and uh, scientist, neuroscientist, who actually had the idea from this short story that people with a very strong photographic memory, like Funes, actually have a problem with the center of the abstract thinking, with the center of imagination. So if we, if we need, if we want to have a strong imagination, if we develop our imagination, we need uh, some empty spaces in our memory. We need a kind of bad memory in a way. Uh, and this is very interesting, uh, how literature interact with, with science. Actually, it's not something new. In the 17th century, they knew. Uh, the scientists knew that everything is connected. So you know that natural historians from 17th century, from 18th century, they they give the whole picture when they describe, when they uh, explore one animal, they give us the whole picture about this animal, how it's, uh, what's the biology process, uh, what's the, what he liked to eat, uh, what the legends about this creature, what stories we know about this, how to cook these creatures even, okay. and, and some other things. So, but you have you had the full picture. So the people, ancient people knew that everything was connected. After that, we, we forgot this a bit. So that's why I really believe in my experience from Time Shelter and from the physics of sorrow before that. I had a really good conversations with the real physicists, with the very serious physicists, and what they interested from the novel is the way to make analog, analog analogies, analogies, analogies between between uh, literature and physics and. Uh, and so on, because in the center of our fields is the human being in the, the space, the cosmos. This is what we are interested in, literature and science. And by the way, uh, yeah, but this is another story. You know that nostalgia that we are using now broadly actually is a diagnosis, it's a very serious diagnosis invented in 17th century by a Swiss doctor. And uh, this is very interesting story also. Uh, so it starts like this, it started like a diagnosis. And now we can, because if we are talking further about the dangers of nostalgia, about the dark side of nostalgia, which uh, I'm, I'm writing about this in my novel, uh, we could see that uh, we should know that nostalgia was invented as an illness. Yeah, I mean, you, so your attitude um, to memory, memory seems to be something that fascinates you. Um, and you, you mentioned that story by Jorge Luis Borges. Um, I know that there are also allusions to Proust um, peppered throughout your work. So you obviously, you know, you, you're a fan of Marcel Proust, the great writer of memory. Um, and, you know, Proust has those famous sensory memory experiences, uh, you know, memories triggered by a phrase of music or triggered by a sight or a smell, a sound. Um, just as an aside, I think that would be another very good example of um, a writer who has um, 
attracted interest among scientists for his discovery, if you like, of the power of sensory memory. Um, so I know lots of neuroscientists like to talk about Proust's role, Proust's involuntary memory experiences. Um, but I, memory also seems to have a slightly, you mentioned the dark side of memory, or you mentioned the dark side of nostalgia. And I think it also has that dual function in your book, Time Shelter. There is a there's there's a, a positive case made for memory and its role in shaping identity and its power and its attractions. And yet memory also seems to be something that's potentially dangerous at a social level, um, perhaps nostalgic memory. Perhaps it's nostalgia when memory goes too far. I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about um, the, the different attitudes to memory that come across in Time Shelter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, that in the beginning, the idea of Gaustin, who invented these clinics for the past, was that uh, we can unlock memory of the people losing their memory. So the people suffering from amnesia or Alzheimer, we can unlock their memory when we put them in situ in a uh, what to say in a in a situation of the of their real time insight. I mean, when you are losing your memory, you are living in your young years, and you could be in the 1970s in your inner time in your mind so you should be in the same 1970s uh, around you in the external uh, space and time and this is a good thing it's a really uh, it, it's a really helpful thing this was a good idea by Gaustin uh, this is a kind of retro therapy and the problem is when more and more people decided to live in the past, not just for an hour or two, but forever. So what I say, that's why I like the, the UK cover of the book, because we have here different rooms, rooms of the past. So one of the memories that it, to, to be nostalgic is a very human feeling. It's, it's a very normal feeling. Uh, but the, we should go back to the room of our memory, to the rooms of our past only for an hour or two and to keep the door slightly open. This is important. And after that, to leave this room and to live in the present and to dream about the future. Uh, when this nostalgia to the past become dangerous, when you try to put into the rooms of the past, the whole nation, the whole society, when you try to invent the collective memory of the group of people, when you try to explain them, look, we, we can be great again, uh, like we never been. Uh, so just, uh, and you start to invent memories for them. This is uh, the dangerous level of the memory. Actually, paradoxically, the flood of the past happened when you stop to remember it. As Gostin says in the book, uh, the less memory, the more past. This is the, the theory or the axiom. So this is the memory is we need it of our memory first, as you said, to keep the, our identity, to know that we are the same boy that we were before, the same young man, the same old man. So we, we keep this continuity. Uh, and losing the memory is losing of identity, of course. Uh, but also there's another level of memorizing. We could have memory also from the things that never happened. This is really interesting for me. Uh, we could have memory for the things we just dreamed of them. We just had a dream that uh, of the things that we read in the books. I mean, yeah, as I read, if for me, some of the scenes of the books became my real 
uh, my real memory, my internal memory. So this is also memory. There are so many levels of the of the memory. I think so. In in your book, Time Shelter, there's this satire, isn't there, um, of political movements that um, you know mobilize collective memories um, in a dangerous way. It's also very funny. I mean, it's a, a, a point to make about your book is it deals with difficult topics, um, but it but it does so in a very humorous fashion. Um, so this, I mean, do you think there are evidently trait, you know, we can recognize um, certain political trends in this kind of satirical form in which they're conveyed in your book. But I'm wondering if you think there's a there's a real risk that something like this might happen in a more tangible way in society. Do you think we're in danger of um, living too much in the past or um, of becoming, you know, absorbed by our pasts? In the way that, that the kind of dystopia that your that your book imagines, yeah, actually it, it happens in a way. I started the book in 2016, uh, uh, and why? Because we had two dangerous political things happened in 2016. Uh, one is connected with uh, the election of Trump and uh, this wave of populism. And another one is connected with the uh, Brexit in UK. Uh, actually, for me, Brexit was a kind of uh, referendum for the past. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there are some pages in the book connected with this. We know for two famous islands or concept of islands in British literature. One is the island by Robinson, the island of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. And another one is the famous island by John Donne. Uh, and so the, the, the idea was which island will choose in this referendum, in this Brexit uh, in UK. Uh, because the island of Robinson Crusoe is the idea that, OK, you can survive alone. You can have everything. Uh, I mean, you can make everything with your own uh, hands. You no need of the other world. The island of John the is in opposite way. As you remember, he says, I, I can't uh, quote it, but no one is an island. Uh, everyone is connected with the continent of the rest and so on and so on. Beautiful words. So this was the election between two islands. Anyway, um, in the second part of my book, when they made this referendum of the past, uh, we can see how when you make a choice, when one society make its choices, how many things are important, not only politics, not only economics, but also some things like popular culture, like uh, some, some irrational thing, uh, how how young you were in these past decades that you should choose, and many, many other things. I wanted to show how many different things, different from politics and economics, are important. We usually underestimate these things because we knew from newspapers, from the first pages of newspapers, they only are uh, dedicated to the politics and economics. The literature and other things are on the next pages, on the last pages, but they are also important when you make when you make your your choice. And to your question, uh, yes, I think that uh, after 2016, we could we could uh, what to say smell in the air this anxiety, and we could find that something goes wrong in the clockworks of time, and. Mm, yeah, and I think what we are facing now uh, with these wars also, it's a kind of turning back to the past, turning back to some one very important year of 20th century, 1939, 
and the end of 30s, which I dedicated many pages to this year uh, in my novel. Mm. Well, thank you. I think we'll take some uh, we'll take some questions from the Q and A. So we have um, um, some some really good questions in there. So uh, just to say thank you to our audience. Um, hopefully, we'll have time to get through them all. So I can see there is a question from Joe Singleton about um, AI and AI. Yeah. There's also another yeah, one. very very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Very interesting. And yes, I'm. Hmm. I'm a bit afraid, but also of, of AI from AI. But also, I know that uh, if I ask AI, tell me about your childhood. I thought, what do you think AI will answer me? Tell me about your childhood. Tell me about your emotions. Tell me about your fears. Tell me about your first nightmare. Uh, I think this is a what to say this is a pile of things that are very important for the writing for story writing for storytelling and i think now it's still the power is still on the our side uh, so uh, yeah uh, but there is there is another thing this interest and this development of the ai now is also a sign. I think that maybe people are too, what to say, lonely. There is a great big loneliness that may be waiting us in the close future. So we know that we should talk with everyone. We don't talk each other. We have a problem with our conversations, with the conversation between us, between human and human people. You know what happened now. And this is a political question as well. Uh, I think most of the cat cataclysms now, catastrophes now, are connected with this inability to talk to each other. So now we slowly will start to looking for other subsetnic, okay, people for, to talk to, for other uh, conversation partners. <laughs> conversation partner, yeah, <laughs> and uh, AI. Uh, we think AI could be something like this. I'm not so sure. There was an interesting question uh, in the sociology. When you are old, imagine that you are old and ill, and you have to, cho to choose who will take care for you. One uh, uh, person who don't know your language from abroad, or kind of AI what you will choose. And people on my age, of course, prefer to person, even you don't understand his language or her language. Uh, so it will be also a generational border. Very interesting. We will see what will happen. But this is my first thoughts about this. OK. Um... I also see there's a question, a question also about AI, um, but a slightly different question um, about the role of, so not only AI in storytelling, but also the role that algorithms play in determining publishing and the attention a story receives. And this person asks, if you were a writer starting today, given these trends, um, what would you tell yourself? Mm -hmm. No, I'm, <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't believe to, in algorithms, uh, especially for writing. Actually, I come from poetry, and uh, in poetry, it's not easy to have algorithm. Uh, and I believe in writing. My writing is happened in this way. I just follow the language. I just follow the voice. I don't have algorithm and I don't have periodic table with the structure of the novel. I don't know what will happen at the end. I just follow the, the voice. And this is my way of writing. And I think that AI will not help me a lot. Okay. 
Um, so another question um, is, do you, this is from Nadia Todorova, um, who asks, do you believe writers carry a responsibility for the stories they choose to put out in the world? Yes, I believe. Yeah, I believe. Uh, I think that stories can change the things. If you believe in the power of stories, you believe that they make something with the world, they make something in the societies, they make something with the people. And uh, so I think every writer has this responsibility. Uh, what kind of stories he chooses to, to tell? Even if I write uh, The Physics of Sorrow, even I, if I write a very sad story, I don't want to put the head of the reader into the mute. Is correct. Mm -hmm. To to I I don't want to be to violate the reader. I want to give a kind of consolation. I want because this is important role of literature. You know that two thousand and more years ago, the consolation was uh, a regular genre in the Roman literature. We know Seneca with his famous consolation to my mother, Helvia. It's a beautiful text. If you read now, you will see how, how contemporary is this text. And so I think that literature, oh, it, this is, of course, my opinion. And I, I want to write in this way. Literature can give a voice of the weak people because usually we say that uh, Victories uh, made history, uh, but the, the defeated ones, they tell stories. And this is much more important for me. And literature could give a meaning. I think this is one of the, the ideas, because without reading, without even without storytelling, our life or what happened in our everyday life will be just trivial, banal, without other meaning beyond of this. And literature knows how to give meaning. This is very important and will will be much more important, I think, in the close future. And literature could create memory. This is another thing, very important thing. I I think that we had seven decades peace after Second World War. And this is a lot of time. It never happened before. Uh, because also of the stories we managed to narrate about the, this period of the war, of the Nazi period, and so on, and so on. So thanks to literature. Um. So a, a question, I think we have a couple of questions about your um, your process as a writer, I suppose we could say. Um, so I'll, I'll do the first of these. It's, um, this is also from Joe Singleton. How do you maintain positive well-being throughout the process of writing whilst dealing with sensitive and difficult subjects? How, you know, uh... The actually the the positive thing, the optimism is inside of the of the very center of the storytelling. You will not write a book, you will not start to tell stories if you don't believe that the world will continue to exist, and then the person that you have a person, you have a story hears uh, in front of you. Uh, so this is the the the, pro the process of positive thinking is in in in, in infiltrated into the same uh, genre of storytelling and uh, literature and novel writing. I I think so. And also, you know, when I think everyone knows this, when you have a sorrow, deep sorrow, when you have some troubles. And you don't know, you couldn't name this sorrow. 
the sorrow is even stronger. The sorrow could really break you, yourself, you. And when you start to tell stories, when you start to write about this sorrow, first, you start to understand it more and more. And second, you, you tame your sorrow in a way. You tame your, fear, your fears in a way. And this is, this is the miracle of storytelling. And this is a miracle of writing. Okay, um, a question from Roger Farmer. I think you may have addressed this um, in part already. Um, it's about um, the structure of Time Shelter um, and how did the structure of Time Shelter develop? Was it premeditated or was it a more dynamic process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, in the idea for the clinics of the past came to me maybe more than 15 years ago. And then I, I put it into my notebook and I forgot, forgot about it. And then in 2016, after 2016, uh, I found this idea. And I decided that I should write this novel, but this novel will have not only this bright, positive uh, first part where the clinics for the past help to the people, but also now something, yeah, happened something else and I should write about this. And that's why the novel has actually, in a way, two parts, which are connected, of course. But the idea, the good idea of, the Ga of Gaustian, the innocent idea for the clinics of the past, developed more and more, growing up, and, uh, and many countries decided to make these referendums for the past. So this, it starts from the small idea for the clinics of the past, then it became so cities of the past, then countries of the past, and then the novel ends with the love with the dementia of the narrator. You can see that the novel became fractured, more and more fractured, because the dementia of the narrator became stronger and stronger. There is an epigraph in the beginning of the novel which explains the structure of the novel. Uh, and it's a, the structure is more or less like the Sarabanda by Handel. Strict repetition, at the same time moving forward, restrained and solemn, as befits a beginning. Afterward, everything can and should fall apart. Actually, there is also uh, a lot of, of course, a lot of stories inside of this novel because we work with stories for the memory and a lot of music. Uh, I made a kind of playlist with a Musics inside of the time shelter. They asked me to make this this list, and actually, there are really, really uh, many pieces of music typical for different decades of 20th century. Because music, as we talked in the beginning, is a big unlocker of memory. Okay, and then we have a question from. Um, Ronan Kennedy about, um, well, I'll, just, I'll just read the question. Um, we know the classic writers you're steeped in, but what contemporary writers would you recommend reading for their reflections of, on the ephemeral memory and the saving power of literature? Thank you, thank you, especially for the ephemeral memory and saving power of literature. That's what I'm interested in. Of course, one of them died this year, Milan Kundera. So I could recommend Milan Kundera. It was very important for my writing, for the writing, of, for the writers of this part of the, the world. But also I could write some of the writers who are my generation. Uh, I could suggest uh, like Olga Tukarczuk, like Mircea Cartarescu, Romanian writer, uh, like uh, Milenko Jergovic uh, from Zagreb. 
Uh, they are writers from Central and East Europe, and they know a lot about perishable things, about memory, about how to have your personal story in the on the backdrop of the big communist monumental history. This is very important. Uh, that's why my novels, it's connected with the structure of my novels and with the structure of the novels by these people, maybe, but some of them. Uh, my novels are, uh, in a way, yeah, fragmented because I'm coming from the literary tradition with a, with a monumental literary tradition. Socialist realism, like a movement, uh, like to have this monumental, ideological, big uh, pieces of writing. And that's why I decided, even in my first novel, natural novel, to write about the flies, domestic flies, to write from the point of view of the domestic flies, to write about the trivial, about the everyday life, about this, uh, because... I don't know uh, how was the names of these French uh, philosophers uh, which said that one of the most well-kept secret of the communist ideology was everyday life. So that's why I wanted to tell about this. I wanted to write novels about this. And these are the names that I mentioned in the beginning, which were important. I think, and I recommend it. Well, thank you very much, um, Georgi, for your responses, your detailed responses to our audience questions, um, and also to my own questions. It's been a fascinating, uh, fascinating lecture and, and discussion. I'll hand back over um, to Bill now, um, who will say a few words. Um, and um, thank so you. to you, Bill. Hello there. Um, back from outer space, it seems. Um, thank you, Georgi. That was everything I'd hoped for from, from the lecture when we first talked about it back in, in the, the earlier part of the year. Um, so thank you for your humanity, your humour, your um, commitment to the small things of everyday life. And it brought to mind as a phrase of Wordsworth, in one of his most famous poems, where he talks about the little, the little unremembered acts of kindness and of love, which is a, a wonderful phrase. And what's delightful about your book is that that the humour is um, not only consolatory, but it's also a wonderful mechanism for for pointing out the sharp things that need to be said as well. Um, a few things about um, about Litfest before I complete wind up completely. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. As you know, Litfest is a um, a volunteer run charity. We don't receive regular um, funding. Um, we are supported by our local city council, Lancaster, for which thanks. And we're very fortunate to have this relationship with Lancaster University. Um, who are the who are our partners in the lecture the two lectures we're currently running the international fiction lecture which you've just heard and also the environment the Lancaster environment lecture which was given by George Monbiot um, back in May um, without their support we would not be able to um, carry out the work that we do we're also enormously grateful to, um, as I'm sure Georgi is too, to Angela Rodell for her wonderful translation, really superb translation of uh, Time Shelter. And um, in a minute, I'll ask you to come into the screen, Angela, and take a bow. But <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you. But for now, I want to say uh, um, one other thing. Um, Please do, when, we've, when the lecture is over, go to our website, um, go to the Support Us page and donate, because that way um, the government will give, for every pound you give, the government will give Litfest 25p extra, 
um, no cost to you, but it's part of their support for the work of charities. And if you haven't read Georg's book, please do buy a copy from the Litfest online bookshop sh book because we've um, been selling copies of Georg's book during the period of the festival. Um, text of Georg's lecture will be available on our website and be um, published internationally by Words Without Orders um, in about 10 days' time. And as um, my colleague Natalie Charlesworth said, you can hear the lecture again if you want to go back to it um, by going to our YouTube channel. So I have three little phrases I took from that lecture. Literature can be an antidote to propaganda. A writer, he thinks, Georgi thinks of the writer as an ear listening to the stories of the world. What a wonderful phrase that was. And never lose sight of the new stories of the future because that's where we need to be heading next. Um, so please thank um, Georgi Gospodino for his lecture, Angela Rodell for her translation, and Sam O'Donoghue for moderating the conversation. We can't do a great round of applause, but imagine um, uh, imagine a digital um, emphatic round of applause from all of us who can listen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.